Good morning, friends. And welcome to worship with First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, here in South Portland, Maine. I am the Reverend Allison Buttrick Patton, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm the Reverend Stephen Savage, and I use he, him pronouns. And we're joined this morning by co-music directors Terry Foster on piano and organ, and Deirdre McClure directing the choir. We're joined by the choir and by our Chimes Choir this morning, both leading us in music this morning, giving thanks for those gifts today. If you are worshiping with us from home on the live stream or during the week, you are being hosted by Alex Rata, who is up in our balcony. If you're here in the room, I invite you to wave both to Alex and to those who are at home, remembering that we are part of an extended worshiping community of folks that are both seen and unseen. We are so glad that you're with us today. If you are a guest, a first timer, or a sometimer in our midst or at home, I invite you to introduce yourself to us. If you're here in the room, there are welcome cards that you will find in the pews. You're invited to fill out the bottom part. There's a front and a back. You can tear it off, put it in the box at the back of the sanctuary, or hand it to an usher if you would like to be included in our email list and keep up to date on what's happening during the week at First Congregational Church. And if you are at home, I invite you to note in the chat your name and your interest in being added to that list, and one of us will reach out to you to get your contact information from you. I think it's now true that you can also go to the website. Am I it right is, about it, this? It is. I wasn't sure where you are going. Which, yes, it is. Is. Steve just made it even easier for you all to sign up to be included in communication at FCC. How do we do that? All you have to do is go to our website, fccucc.org, and go to the Contact Us tab at the top. There'll be a, a link in, in the screen that pops up that says Contact Info Update Form. Click on that and you'll get the whole, basically it's a welcome card on your computer. Nice. Yeah. You hear the word welcome a lot whenever we gather, because welcome is really central to who I believe we are here at First Congregational Church. It doesn't matter what brings you into this space each Sunday, whether it's the folks you sit with in your pews, a deep need you feel for guidance and, and forgiveness, or coffee hour, Amen. whatever brings you in, you're welcome here. In fact, we remember that welcome each week. It's so central to this uh, this community. So please remember it with me using the words you'll find in your bulletin or the, they should be on your screen. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Friends, this Lent our theme is Wandering Heart. We've been focusing on the life and faith of Peter, that most famous disciple, who is both steadfast and unsteady, friend and betrayer, follower and wanderer. In Peter, we see a normal human being trying to figure it all out, just like us. You may notice that each Sunday's title is a line from the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. This morning, we turn to the line, Teach Me, as in, Teach Me Some Melodious Sonnet. We become students of a sort, along with Peter, asking our most pressing questions. What does faithfulness look like? Not just on the good days, but when conflict disrupts our lives and communities. When our bodies, hearts, or spirits are harmed, what does it mean to forgive one another? 
Beloved in Christ, let us worship the God of wanderers like us. Friends, would you rise on your feet or in your hearts as we call ourselves to worship? Why are you here? I am seeking God with my whole heart, with my entire mind, with a fire burning in my bones. I see it. You are in the right place. This is God's house, and the door is open to you. I am seeking God with my whole heart, with my entire mind, with a fire burning in my bones. We see that in you. You are in the right place. This is God's house. And the door is open to you. Beloved, let us worship God. Let us learn from the Spirit. Amen. Would you join your voices with ours as we sing together, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Verses 1, 3, 4, 5, it's number 224 in our hymn. study Peter's story in scripture, it's almost impossible to ignore how much he loved to ask questions. He asks Jesus, what does the parable mean? Where are you going? How many times should we forgive? Like a tenacious child, Peter was eager to learn even when it meant that his way of life was challenged. We can be like that too. Open to guidance, receptive to Christ's invitation to turn 
times should I forgive? Jesus says 77 times, or as often as it is needed. That abundant grace exists for you as well. No matter what you have done or left undone, no matter what lessons you have learned or are still learning, God's grace exists for you. God's will, God's love will never run out. So hear and rest in this good news. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are invited to serve. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now I invite you to pass the peace of Christ to one another with a wave, a handshake. If you're joining us from home online, you can uh, type a piece into the chat or share an emoji. However you would like to share that piece with one another, share that piece now and don't forget to offer it to the folks at home. Peace. Peace of Christ. Are there any younger folks that would like to join me up front this morning? There are. Wonderful. Hello, Sam. Hello, Abby. Today we're going to hear about forgiveness in church. And I wonder... If you've ever forgiven anyone before, you have? This is good. How about you? Do you have you ever forgiven anyone before? Yeah? I hope, I hope you have. Because when we, get ang- so when we get angry with one another, when someone hurts our feelings, when something, when someone uh, takes, takes our favorite toy or, or steals our place in line or or tells a lie about us, or, or does something that hurts us or makes us angry, it's easy to hold that inside and kind of let it uh, bubble up. What, what, is ever, what has anyone ever done to you that you've been angry at them about, or done that you've been angry about? Nothing? That's, you're, I, I like how patient you are. Very impressive. How about you, Abby? Anything you ever made? Trying to think? Uh, let's see. So I like the, I have certain treats that I really like in my house. And uh, sometimes I'll come to the box and find that it's empty and it's just been put back in the cabinet. (laughs) And I can basically follow the crumbs to the culprit and it makes me kind of angry. And sometimes I'll carry that frustration around with me. 
Is there anything that makes you, have you thought of anything? No? Someone steals your treats too? Oh, people got to stay out of other people's treats. I'm telling you. <laughs> All right, we're not going to point fingers here, but. Or how about if someone, you, how about if a good friend of yours, you, you, you do something together, but when maybe you got in trouble and they didn't, they, they said it was all you. That would make you pretty angry, right? Well, that would make, or, or frustrated or kind of upset. Or maybe if your best friend forgot your birthday. That would hurt your feelings, probably. Can anyone else think of anything that might upset you, that might make you angry or hurt your feelings, that you might carry around with you? Kind of. They canceled last minute, and you were looking forward to that plan, those plans. That's different than when you don't want to go along and do the things. But, right. So they canceled the plans last minute. That can make you angry. How about anything else? A couple more? Or upset? Oh, yeah. You see someone bullying someone. That's really hard. How about one more? So somebody takes away some of your time so you don't have enough time to do what you're trying to do. Did I see a hand up over here too? Well, Silly's okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or when you mop the floor and someone comes walking across it as you're, fin- you're putting the mop back in the bucket. Yep, I've been there. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna to put these last two in here. And then I was thinking, what if you had to carry that around with you all day, Sam? Do you think you'd like that? Take it, pick it up. Can you pick that up? What if you tried to carry that to, you to, to your practice? For you? You play, is it soccer seat? What, what are you playing right now? Baseball. If you had to carry that to baseball practice, that would be really hard, wouldn't it? And uh, you're, you're playing softball right now, right? Do you think that would be hard to carry at softball practice or at a game? Probably. Take, pick it up. See if it's heavy. That's a lot to carry around, right? Well, one of the cool things about forgiveness, and this... Um, is you can say, you know what, I forgive you. And you can set it down. I was angry, but I don't want to be angry anymore. I forgive you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this down. It's important to remember that if there's something really hard that comes up in your life, that it's not unimportant. But forgiving someone can let you stop being angry. You should definitely go talk to someone if there's something that happens that isn't, something serious happens or scary or something that hurts you and you're having a hard time dealing with it, definitely go talk to a trusted adult um, and, and, and if you can, set down some of that anger. And then eventually, and it's going to take me half an hour to take all these books out of this bag. We were really carrying a lot of frustration around with us. But if you get it all set down and you forgive the people who, who frustrate you, this probably wouldn't be that bad to carry, would it? No. You could probably handle that. Might make uh, running, uh, the training for running more productive because you'd have the... Anyway. Um, but yeah, forgiveness is wonderful because it not only lets the other person know that you've forgiven them, but it also relieves you of that thing you had to carry, that anger or that frustration or that sadness a little bit. So something to think about when you think about forgiveness. And now I think there are some intrepid Sunday school teachers that are ready to take you on to Sunday school if you'd like to go. Enjoy. Oh, forgiveness feels good. Good morning. 
My name's Judith Borelli, and I use she, her pronouns. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Open our hearts and minds, O Lord, by the gift of your Holy Spirit, so that as the word is read and proclaimed, we may hear what you have to say to us today. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 22. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If you are listened to, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If that person refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father, Mother in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if my brother or sister sin against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of this holy word. Will you pray with me? God of grace and majesty, oil the hinges of our heart's doors that they may swing easily open to welcome you. Amen. So why do you suppose Peter asked the question, how often should I forgive? Is he just trying to get this whole being a disciple thing right? Given that he's just been scolded by Jesus, remember, for objecting to the idea that Jesus would soon be killed. Maybe Peter is feeling the need for a little extra clarification. How to become a faithful disciple in three easy steps. Now, Jesus is just given a remarkably succinct primer on how to navigate conflict in community. And Peter raises his hand with a follow-up question, like the student chasing bonus points for class participation. He asks, well, how many times, Jesus? One wonders if he was really asking, exactly how often do I need to forgive to pass the class? to satisfy the requirement before I can walk away from the people and the communities who have hurt me most? Was he asking for a friend? Or, like most of us, at one time or another, because he had been hurt himself? Either way, I feel some empathy for Peter. Forgiveness is hard work. 
I think that's what Peter was grappling with. Some days it feels easier, less messy, to live with our hurts than to go through the steps required to confront and mend them. So many things can get in the way. I may be afraid of being hurt again or worried that forgiving someone will let them off the hook for the harm that they've caused. I might struggle to muster any real compassion for the one who has inflicted the harm. Or if the damage is severe, I may need all my energy to tend to my own wounds. Some days, what I really want before I'll even consider forgiving is for the offending party to acknowledge my pain, to feel it somehow in their own bodies and spirits, to experience remorse, and then to take it all back, to say to me, I was wrong, I was awful, I am so sorry. And that might happen, but it might not. Not at first, and maybe never. Or it might work out in some relationships, but not in others. Forgiveness, friends, it's a tricky thing. More a process that we pursue than a state that we achieve. Like a garment that's been torn, it takes time and attention to repair a wound. And the larger the tear, the more the stitches, the more time and attention it requires. So, 77 times, Jesus says to Peter, or 70 times 7, depending on on your translation. And I can almost picture Peter doing the math in his head, furiously taking notes, before realizing that Jesus may not have meant his response, literally. You don't have to hang out with Jesus long to realize that he rarely gave a direct answer to anything. In fact, he was much more likely to respond to a question with a story or with another question. Fun fact, Jesus posed 307 questions over the course of his ministry and answered only three of them. Maybe as many as seven, depending on how you count. So no, Jesus was not suggesting that Peter or we forgive up to 77 times or even up to 490 times. And yet Jesus did answer Peter's question in a way that shifts my thinking about the entire forgiveness project. So here's the thing. In Hebrew, the word seven is spelled with the same consonants as the word complete or full. And so in Jewish tradition, the number seven represents completeness wholeness. Think seven days to create the world, and on the seventh day, God rested. Jesus, steeped in the Jewish tradition of his upbringing, would have known this, would have chosen those numbers, all those sevens, with purpose. So, how often should we forgive? As often as it takes to make us whole, Jesus tells Peter. As often as it takes to mend that garment, to repair our hearts 
the community, God's whole world. Maybe that feels like a tall order. But Jesus tells us how to begin one conversation at a time, one hard and tender conversation between two or three or more people willing to listen to each other, willing to witness to pain and imagine a better way. In the words of the Reverend Laura Wright Pittman, the movement toward wholeness is the movement toward one another. Now, friends, I want to be really clear here that the work of forgiveness looks different depending on whether we're talking about a flare-up between friends, family abuse, a school shooting, or the generational harm caused by systemic racism or sexism or homophobia. This is what makes talking about forgiveness and pursuing it so messy. Throughout the history of Christianity, calls for forgiveness have too often served to silence sufferers and to sweep abuses under the rug. Maybe you know this from personal experience. Too often. The Christian church has told victims of violence, including survivors of domestic and sexual assault, that the faithful response is to forgive the assailant seven times, 70 times. And that guidance is typically accompanied by advice to stay in the abusive relationship to stifle anger, or to keep silent about that family violence. As if the truth would be more damaging to the community than the harm is to those who suffer it. As if the truth would be more damaging to the community than the harm is to those who suffer it. Beloved in Christ, this is a lesson in forgiveness gone wildly awry. There is nothing healing about remaining in an abusive relationship, bearing the brunt of bigotry or repressing pain. Bad behavior gone unaddressed never gets us closer to wholeness, nor are the people who suffer responsible to redeem those who have caused the harm. Let me say that again. Bad behavior gone unaddressed, it never gets us closer to wholeness. And the people who suffer are not responsible to redeem those who have caused the harm. This is not the vision of healing and wholeness to which Jesus calls us. Jesus, who repeatedly spoke and acted in defense of those made vulnerable by oppressive systems. Jesus, who befriended women and welcomed children healed those with infirmities that had isolated them from their communities. Jesus was concerned not with keeping order, but with empowering human flourishing. He knew that we tend to break each other's heart. That, in the words of the young protagonist in Barbara Kingsolver's novel, Demon Copperhead, the world runs on hurt people wanting others to feel the same hurt. Jesus knew that our lives are messy. 
recognized that we have work to do, tender, hard, holy work to do. And so he taught us how to practice, reminded Peter and us that some conflicts can be resolved with one brave conversation. Others need the presence and support of one or two additional people. Sometimes repair involves an entire community, working together to mend a hurt, tending to the wounded until they are ready to speak their truth, and holding space for those who have caused harm to be transformed. But when none of that works, well, Jesus says, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. And at first blush, you might assume that that means let that one be banished. You've done the best you could. You need to move on. But consider for just a moment how Jesus treated tax collectors and Gentiles. How he broke bread with one tax collector, though it caused a scandal, and healed a blind Gentile. In other words, beloved in Christ, no one is beyond the reach of Christ's goodness and grace. We may not be able to resolve all the conflicts on our own or harness all the compassion needed to mend every broken heart, including our own. But I promise you this, Christ is standing by and with boundless care and patience, he is guiding us even now, toward our healing and the healing of the whole world, one step at a time. Trusting that, may we continue to be students of forgiveness. Continue to practice where we can, when we can, how we can to speak the truth without fear, to listen deeply and tenderly to each other, to bear witness to pain, and then to imagine a better way. Seven times seven times seven times seven times seven times. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen.
beloved in Christ, we move now into a prayerful space. And as we do so, we lift up the names of people who are hearts on our hearts and our minds today. We remember Pat Thatcher and her son and lift up continued healing prayers for Scott. We ask prayers for Bill Tranter, Diane Armstrong's brother-in-law, who is journeying through hospice. And we offer up prayers for healing for Deborah and others we can name in our hearts in this space. I want to invite you to join me in a little practice of forgiveness as we pray together today. And so I invite you to take a deep and spirit-filled breath to notice the tension that you might be carrying in your body, to settle in to the place where you are seated today, to find the ground beneath your feet, to close your eyes if you are comfortable doing so, or take a soft and unfocused gaze, and ask your heart Is there something or someone in my life that needs forgiveness today? Is there someone that I am struggling to forgive? Only you know where you are on that journey toward forgiveness. Whether you need space to find your voice, whether you need the community to circle round, whether you feel ready to speak your truth or to draw closer to someone on a quest to make amends. You know, God knows. So this morning, I invite you to hold that circumstance in your heart for a time. As we abide in the silence to listen for the way that you are being guided on this particular journey of faith. God of overflowing grace. Forgiveness is hard. The wounds that we bear, they are our own. We don't always know how to mend them. And some hurt runs deep. Accompany us today, we pray. Be patient with us. And prod us gently. That we might take step after step toward the wholeness that you promise for this, your beloved world. Where there is fear, lend assurance. Where there is isolation, lend community. Where there has been silence, lend the courage to speak. Where one has been ignored, lend us ears to hear. 
where there is separation. Lend us the courage to step toward one another. Where there has been a tear in the fabric of a life or community, lend us the thread to mend it. And where our own energy runs out, lend us the grace that we might finally bridge the gap. God of overflowing grace, we ask it and all things, trusting that you abide with us this whole way, trusting that you meet us wherever we are on the journey, and that you give us what we need. Holding that promise in our hearts, we join our voices now to pray words taught to us by your Son and our teacher, Jesus Christ saying together, Our Father, Mother in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The work of this church is amazing. This church does so much in so many different places, from generosity, compassion, kindness. The faces of this church in the world outside of this building are many. Food is provided to those that are hungry, comfort to those that are lonely or who are sick. There is presentations and presence, a ministry of of witness that this church does to bring attention to injustice and to need. All of these things are exactly what Christ has called us to do. And you make it possible. You make it possible to go out and to do these things, to gather here and to recognize God among us and in the faces of those who we see in the pews. You make it possible for us to bring this moment here today to folks who can't make it into this building and who gather at home. It's your generosity. It's the giving that you, you do each and every day, giving of your time and your energy, of your ideas, your passion, and, yes, your money. 
your financial contributions make all of this work in the real world. Thank you. And yet, as we often have to do, we want to encourage you to be generous yet again, to be as generous as you are able in whatever ways you are able to be generous. If you'd like to make a financial contribution today, you can do it in a number of ways. There's a box at the back of the sanctuary, if you're in, in this room right now. But if you're not here right now, or if you're inspired to give later, to give again, you can do so online. You can go to our website, fccucc.org. There's a donate button in the top right corner. Click that and you can make a safe online donation. You can also do it by scanning the uh, QR code that is in your bulletin and may even be on your screens. However you choose to give, I encourage you to be as generous as you are able, knowing that it is your gifts that make the gifts that we give to the world as a church possible. Join me now in a moment of contemplation as we consider the ways that we feel called to be generous today. Friends, join me in a spirit of prayer as we join our voices, well, our hearts together to bless the generosity of this tremendous community. Beloved God, take the gifts that are given. Transform them through your love into what is needed by the world. We ask these things. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our closing hymn, I almost forgot, I should sing a song. Our closing hymn today is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's number 407 in the hymnals. I encourage you to rise on your feet if you're able uh, and sing it with us.
FCCUCC will be holding an in-person vigil this year following the Good Friday service until midnight Friday night. We encourage you to join us in the sanctuary instead of the chapel as we've done in the past for an hour or two to quiet your mind, pray or read spiritual material as you keep Christ in mind and prepare for the miracle of Easter. Reading material and reflections will be available in the sanctuary. You can sign up online or on the easel near the sanctuary. We welcome an unlimited number of vigil watchers for this opportunity to remember the woman who waited at the cross following Christ's crucifixion. If you have any questions, please contact Carrie Skeffington. We're trying something new this year. You're invited to join us for our Maundy Thursday service on March 28th, which will, which will include communion and a soup supper to commemorate Jesus' last meal with the disciples. This is a change from our traditional Good Friday soup supper. We will gather in Guptal Hall at 5.30 for the meal and service. See your weekly word for a link to sign up to contribute soup for the soup supper. We hope to see you there. Today is the last day to order Easter lilies, daffodils, or tulips to adorn the altar on Easter Sunday. All orders must be in by today, Sunday, March 17th, and you can find an order form in your bulletin or in the weekly word. And at this time, I'd like to call up Chris Kiter and Bruce Lockwood for a couple of additional announcements. Good morning, my name is Chris Keiter. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm here to talk about the, uh, the mission trip information meeting. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a uh, terrific uh, mission trip service where we talked about the work that we do and how meaningful it is for us. And today we're following that up with an information uh, session for those who might be interested in going with us this uh, summer and that will be held in Davidson Lounge at 11.30. Uh, if you are, want to attend via Zoom, uh, please email me at cf, as in Fred Keiter, K-E-I-T-E-R, at gmail.com. I will check at about 11.25 and send out uh, last minute emails. Um, there will be a number of old timers who are there. there are, I'm also very pleased to announce that there will be some new timers who are there, who will be here, including a certain person directly to my left. Um, if you are able to uh, swing a hammer or paint with a paintbrush, uh, you are more than qualified. Everyone is, uh, is welcome to come and I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks. Good morning and happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, my name's Bruce Lockwood and I go by he and him. And uh, I, was, uh, I was trying to figure, I think I'm gonna go for a walk on Good Friday <laughs> at 6 a.m. And I was trying to figure out where I was gonna walk. And I'm gonna walk rain or shine at 6 a.m. on Good Friday, March 29th. Because I'm gonna walk with Jesus and as I do that walk, I'm going to be thinking about those in our community who don't have enough food. So I can do my small part to raise money to help with their food insecurities. So I'd love to have people join me, get out in the community, get some good exercise, some good air. I've got sponsor sheets for walkers, and I need some help with uh, a couple of people to drive monitor vehicles and a couple of people to arrange for refreshments when the walkers get back. So I'll be in the uh, fellowship hour and I'd love to uh, talk with you and hear from you. And if you want to sponsor, you're welcome to do that as well. Thank you. See the weekly word for even more of what's happening here at First Congregational Church. And if you're not currently receiving the weekly word, please email Pastor Steve at steve at fccucc.org or go to our website and click on contact us where you'll find a link to a contact info update form. Thank you.
On your way out of worship this morning, I invite you to go around and through the corridor by the round wall where you will not only find the wandering path that we have been filling in during the season of Lent, but also a brand new installation in honor of Women's History Month, courtesy of the mission team. So check out the details on that wall. I want to invite you to note in your bulletins an event that's coming up on April 7th. So it's after Easter. So this is just a make a note and save the date for a faith and money conversation. It's being hosted by some of the team members of our planned giving task force. It's an opportunity for you to come and learn a little something about the different ways that you can be generous with the resources that you've been given. In general, how can we give? And in particular, how can we support First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ? I commend to you the details that are in your bulletin. Come and reach out to me if you are curious about that workshop and join us on that Sunday after church, April 7th. Next Sunday, next Sunday, Deirdre and Terry and Steve and I have been cooking up a Palm Sunday celebration for the books. Not sure which books yet, but <laughs> we've been cooking. Y'all may remember, if you've been to a Palm Sunday service before, that it's built around the story of Jesus' procession into Jerusalem, that there is a parade. There is. And on that parade, there are palms, you may have picked up on it in the name, waved by those in attendance as they celebrate Jesus' entry into the city, and they call out Hosanna, an idea I'm going to get into next week, but that means save us, uh, recognizing Jesus as one who's come to rescue us. So it's going to be quite a day. So here's what we're going to do. Next Sunday, when you get here, don't come inside. Nope. Meet us in the parking lot. Over there. We're going to be in the parking lot. Not over there. In the parking lot. <laughs> we will hold a few spaces open, free of cars, so that we can gather as a congregation. Now, no fear. We will have a small number of chairs for those who would prefer to sit for the five or ten minutes that will be out there. And if you really prefer to come inside, you can welcome the paraders from here in your seat. So that is available to you as well. But I hope that if your body and spirit permit, you will join us out there and help us parade in here as we declare the good news of Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. We'll see you next Sunday. Until then, beloved wanderer, as you leave this place, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in all those you meet. May you find the courage to speak your truth and the grace to forgive. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, Take heart, it is I, be not afraid. Friends, you are called, you are blessed. In both your ups and your downs, you always belong to God. So go now in peace, trusting in that good news. Amen.